Have you ever done something really shitty to a friend? Yes. No, I mean really shitty. You doubt me? Let's examine the facts. I dropped out of Stanford in my sophomore year for no good reason, mind you, other than I just did not like doing homework. You can imagine what that did to my parents. Then I got married and divorced twice. I love both my wives dearly. And I knew the whole time I was gay. Talk about doing something shitty to a friend. Yeah, that's pretty bad. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> You're next. I just need to get out of this town. And you will. You will. Eventually. But don't confuse a new place with a new you. I've made that mistake more than once. You know, you asked me before why I stick around here. I don't know. Maybe that's why. Might as well face myself right here. It's as good a place as any. And as for your friend, oh. I'd be worth it to say I'm sorry. Just say it. Hello. I'm going to try not to make any bacon jokes, so <laughs> bear with Good me. Good luck. <laughs> yeah. um, congrats on this film and on your directing debut. Can we get a round of applause for Kira? This is her first time. We were talking uh, backstage about how I had read this book a, a little bit ago because uh, my mom had told me to, and we were saying it's a, a timeless story. Yeah. Um, but why do you think it's timeless? Oh, gosh. I think it deals with how incredibly hard it is to be a girl, um, to be a teenager in general, to be a girl specifically, um, to be discovering your sexuality and trying to explore your sexuality under the microscope right now of social media. Um, I think... Um, I think there's a lot of pressure on girls to be, you know, so many things, not a prude, not a slut, both of which have negative connotations, but somehow be sexually active, but not too active. I mean, it's, it's very complicated, but I think the timelessness of the story is really because it's a family story. It's about, it, it's really about a dysfunctional family that's already struggling. And then there's a trauma thrown in. What, what happens in this story is that at 13, this, this girl makes a, a sex tape with her boyfriend and it goes viral. And we meet her three years later and we really see the consequences of her actions and how it's fractured the family and it's made her a social pariah and um, her father literally cannot even look at her. And, um, and, and she's having to navigate the world feeling like such an outcast. And it's how, you know, she learns to forgive herself and others and take control of her own narrative. But to me, the, the, the idea of, of being a struggling teenager, I mean, who had a great teenage life? I mean, is there anybody here who had an easy breezy time being a teenager? One. <laughs> I love that. And she's like, yeah, that would be me. We've got to hear your story later. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So when you had read this book, I'm assuming, is that when it kind of clicked that, ooh, this would be a great film, this yeah, would be a great absolutely. story to tell? Absolutely, because like I said, I do think it's a timeless story. And and I do think that, that I don't think there's enough out there for, for teenagers. I don't think there's enough out there for families to really see themselves reflected back. And I'm a, I'm a big proponent of, that's how we process what we're going through as humans, is through art and music and film and television and and we need to see reflections of ourselves and understand that oh we're not alone or look how that person dealt with it yeah. and so ryan guys this is ryan she's so Hi. great in this movie by the way um what was it like for you to take on the role of dd Dee Dee and uh what did this project mean to you and discovering who you are too as a young woman i'm sure i loved working on this project first of all i had a great director and um i i really felt like Deanna's story was important to tell, especially um, with the social media aspect because social media is everywhere. It's really a huge way in how we 
present ourselves to the world, but it's so easy to get really excited about it and put something out there that we might regret in the future. And I think it's a really important message for young adults, boys and girls, you know, who are experimenting who are experimenting with sexuality and social media at the same time to show that like you have to be careful on what you put out there and it's exciting, but make sure you have a real filter, you know, uh, be be discreet in what you put out there. Um, and I think that you, being so young, you have a lot of pressure to prove a certain part of yourself or to grow up faster than you might have liked to. And so just, you know, to have some restraint when you, when you put your images out there. I think that's such an important topic too that this film demonstrated. Is it because the book didn't really touch on social media? I think it was from ten years ago or so. Mm -hmm. um, but you you added that component. Um, was it important for you and for all of you? you? Can all speak on this to bring in that that social media aspect of it and how it's kind of changing teenagehood or, or childhood. Basically. Yeah, I do. I mean, I think it just dials up to eleven how hard it is to be a teenager because I, I mean, I think you're just you're 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 trying to find your identity anyway, and I think that's one of the big struggles as a teenager. Is you're like, well, I'm, I mean, first I was a prep, and then I was a total hippie, and then I was like a brainy person, although I wasn't really ever a brainy person. <laughs> but um, you know, I, I I think we sort of touch on these moments, and then we th blow it out there, and then people have comments. I mean, my God, you know. I had enough sort of bullying just to my face. I can't imagine actually seeing it in black and white and letting other and other people are seeing that the, those comments as well. I mean, I just think it would be devastating. I know Travis had some experience with you know cyberbullying. I think most most teenagers do. Sure. <laughs> well, for I feel like for us too. Like I I didn't grow up with social media. Um, as a teenager, I barely had like a cell phone when I was in high school. But now, you know, being in my 20s and entering my 30s with it, it's it's different. Do you find that too, Travis, how it's kind of changed your world at all, social media? Absolutely. I mean, you really have the power in your hands. I think it's changed everybody's world. I think it's changed the world of children, teenagers, and even people that are more in the public eye where, you know, they have the ability to post anything and do anything and like there really is no uh there's no sanctuary of being away from the world seeing you all the time yeah. and just being able to see what they want whenever they want mm -hmm. and also he said children and teenagers and everyone but parents too and that's a huge part of our story is like you you can't hide your social media from your parents if they want to find it they'll find it and you know, it's it's parents see their kids grow up and see a different child than they know at home. It, it's a it's a weird phenomenon. Yeah. yeah. Have you had that experience with Travis and Sosie? Maybe like, uh, you know, talking to them about social media and using it in in the right way. I don't. know, I kind of feel like um, uh, Travis twenty eight, Sosie's twenty five. Uh, I almost feel like we were about five years on, like, not, not past it, but it was just slightly easier yeah. uh, transition from where kids are at now. And, you know, things are happening so mm -hmm. quickly. I remember, like, I think you were, like, on MySpace or something. That was the first yeah. thing, maybe. Yeah. Definitely had one of those. Yeah, yeah. yeah. MySpace and LiveJournal. Yeah. LiveJournal, right, right. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, Kira mentioned the comments when you think about... Uh, what uh, what somebody might say say to you what, when we were kids, you know, uh, if you came back to your locker and someone wrote an anonymous note, yeah. stuck it in your locker, you'd say, "Oh wow, who so who said that?" And then you kind of you you get you know you're you're a jerk, and you know you're like really really upset about it. But you could just pick up your phone and you could have ten thousand anonymous mm -hmm. comments, mm -hmm. you know, and they can be, uh, you know, it's something that I. Uh, excuse my language, but I call it, you know, cyber balls. It's like people have a uh, kind of courage to say things uh, in, in an anonymous way that they wouldn't say to somebody's face. And, and that, to me, I think, is one of the things that can be so devastating and so sad for, for uh, people, yeah. kids, it's really people in general. Yeah, people hide behind social media, for sure. Um, how did you get Kevin Bacon to be in your film, Kira? I mean, <laughs> I could say some really interesting things, but I won't. Um, I begged him. Um, I, uh, you know, I've been trying to make this film for ten years. Uh, so we tried to get it made as an independent feature for ten years, and and um, 
and I was always hopeful that Kevin would be in it. I really had in mind for him to play Michael, and, and he loved the role always. Who's the sort of reluctant mentor that that guy that you saw? That's her her boss, and she he sort of is the. I mean, in some ways, he's the real catalyst for change. He really helps her and supports her and, like, unconditionally loves her on some level in a way that she isn't getting at home. Uh, so I, I was just lucky, I guess. <laughs> yeah, what drew you to this role? Um, why did you want to play Michael? What was special about him? I don't know. You know, even when I read the, the book, uh, I just felt like um, uh, he just... There was enough there to think that he could have had a very, very interesting life. And we talked a lot about what, what, where he might have gone in his life and how it brought him back to this, this um, town, this kind of uh, small and foggy, chilly town to, to have kind of like a crappy um, pizza restaurant that's not really doing well. And, and uh, I don't know, there was just a lot of stuff about him that, that seemed... Um, um, just com complex, and and also, you know, I, I'm always looking for something that is not really like right down the pike from what I've done before. And this was a guy that I don't think I'd really um, tapped into. Certainly not at this age. Yeah. I know when we first meet you in the fi uh, film, you're doing yoga. And yeah, which I don't do, by the way. You don't do yoga? No, I mean I have taken yoga, and <laughs> Kira kind of got me into yoga, and I just I can't stand yoga. <laughs> How about Ryan? Do you do yoga? <laughs> I used to do more of it, but um, I did some on set with Kevin. Oh, He's that's not right. we that did, bad. Yes. Yeah, we did. We, uh, we did the standing smoking thing. Yeah, yeah, we did that. What's that called, that pose? Tree. Tree. Tree, pose. <laughs> Tree with a cigarette. Nice. Uh, Ryan, what was it like for you to work with the Bacon family and, and kind of be a part of their world and learn from them a little bit? Because I'm sure, you know, they have a lot of experience in the business. I'm really just so see stand in. <laughs> um, no, it was really great. Um, I, Kira and I met at her home before we started shooting and it was very welcoming and everyone's really chill, down to earth, very lovely people. I'm only saying that because they're here. <laughs> yeah, yes, G good, good answer. Yeah, and Travis, you actually score the film. We did. Um, that deserves a round of applause. It's hard work. <laughs> um, I've started to learn the correct term is write the score, wrote yeah. the score to the film, because every time I've told somebody that, they're like, "Way to go! You <laughs> scored." <laughs> um, what was that process like for you? Did, did you kind of? Uh, see the footage and then go about making the music? Or did you have an idea in mind before? I actually had an idea right after I read the script. And that's kind of when I just went into the studio and started writing things. And I wanted to represent, uh, what I really wanted to represent was just this sinking feeling of anxiety that you feel when you, know, you run into somebody that you have an issue with or you read something about you on social media. Um, and I started kind of writing with that in mind, and I wrote a few things that did make it to the final product, but it wasn't until I really saw the footage and I needed to capture the modes that I started, like, really channeling the emotion there. Yeah. And so did you go to Travis, uh, asking him not to do it, all. or did he, yeah? Not at all. No, it I was begged. A, it was a, <laughs> please, would you, mom, would you please. Say I begged. Yeah, exactly. We all were doing a lot of begging. No, I mean, I'm telling you, it was a total shock to me because, first of all, I, he asked to read it, which I was sort of surprised about. And Travis has been a musician since he was 12, and he has written music, and he has written music for some TV shows, but I just never in a million years thought about it. And, um, I, I, and he asked to read the script. He read it and then said, you know, I have some ideas. I'd love to, you know, tool around with a few few things and, you know, send them to, to you know, to you, and if you don't like it, no harm, no foul. And I thought, oi, this is going to be so uncomfortable. I just, I can't, I can't hand this movie, Definitely my not first like movie, it. over to, you know, a novice. But the music really, it really haunted me. And I, and so we were cutting, I was cutting with the editor, cutting the film as we were shooting it. So she would drop in Travis's cues that he gave us for free good way to get into the business do <laughs> stuff for free first <laughs> and um it was beautiful and, and then I couldn't get out of my head and then and then I just you know then he ended up scoring the movie we sort of always had a plan b but we never needed to go there yeah, that's awesome. 
Did you guys know your kids wanted to be in the business? Because uh, Sosie uh, is in this too, and she's incredible. She's in 13 Reasons Why as well. She's had a great year. Yeah. Um, you know, Trav's first word was guitar. He was a musician. There was no stopping that train um, from the time he was a little little boy. I mean, what was the first band you played in? Probably your 12 or something like that? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, he was about 12. Like, it was a, like not even just playing music, but playing like shows, live shows. Um, Sosie, uh, I cast her as Kira as a young girl in a flashback in a movie that I was directing called uh, Lover Boy that Kira produced. And uh, I needed a 10 year old girl to play the young Kira Sedgwick. And I was like, well, she's perfect. And plus, I was playing the dad. Yeah. So it was this kind of strange time travel thing. But um, uh, she kind of convinced us that it really wasn't what she wanted to do with her life. And I think that, in retrospect, she was sort of trying to make us happy because she thought that we didn't really... Like it or not, we had given her the message that becoming an actor was going to be a too tough a life. And and um, especially, you know, uh, being... a daughter of a successful uh, acting couple. And um, eventually, only, you know, maybe in her s second year of college, she just um, packed up her car and came home and said, I'm an actress. And, and we were kind of um, shocked. But uh, clearly, I, I think we were both really thrilled because a as hard as it is to, uh, to have this kind of life because there's a lot of rejection and there's a lot of struggle and it's the same thing for a musician um you know the the the, the world is filled with the word no um or you're not good enough uh you, it's a tough thing to want to you know have your kids go through that you know um when they could be a dental assistant or something have a nice good you know paying Come job a doctor. Yeah. you know um but uh I think that on on the other hand, if you have something that you're you're really good at and you you don't do it, you don't use that part of of your creative life, it's going to kind of eat away at you. So we're happy that they're both doing what they're doing. We're very proud of them both. Awesome, powerful family here in the business. <laughs> Travis, did you always know that you wanted to be uh, in this field? And and what was it like growing up with Kieran and Kevin as parents? It's pretty cool. Um, I always knew I wanted to be a musician and uh, definitely like a record producer um, and, an, and an engineer, which is also what I do in addition to playing in bands and now film scoring. But um, yeah, this was the first time I ever attempted anything like this. And I have to say it was one of the most rewarding and special experiences I've ever had. And it makes me want to do way more of it. And um, growing up with these two, <laughs> I, kn I knew you were going to try here. to get around that one. <laughs> I was. You have three minutes. <laughs> right. How do I sum that up? Um, they have always been incredibly supportive of my journey and my music. I mean, they came to see my black metal band play last night. <laughs> And, um, you know, any sort of genre I was doing or was interested in or anything that I wanted to do, um, they let me pile into a van when I turned 18 and drive around the country and go on my first couple tours and everything. So it was great growing up with these two. I think that's a huge part of this movie, too, is the support of your parents and how much that means, especially as a teenager. Um, Ryan, your character in this kind of, her dad and her have this... Uh, kind of weird relationship where before it was very close and then after this happens, it kind of changes. Um, did you grow up with supportive parents as well when you were? Definitely. Yeah. My parents are two of my favorite people um, and we're very close. And any strain that we've ever had in the past has really affected me. So I was able to relate to Deanna in that way. Um, it just, there's like this emptiness. There's like a void and it feels really awful and shameful when you're in the same room and you're going through a tough time. Um, so I was able to tap into that for Deanna, definitely. Yeah, that's a great story. Uh, two of her favorite people, Trav. That was a good one. Did you hear that? <laughs> you should have used that. Excuse me. <laughs> so good. I think most people don't have that with their parents, though. I mean, I really think that most people struggle and have conflict and get neglected and have trauma, you know? So I think that's one of the reasons why 
or at least very difficult times that they literally simply cannot get past. Um, I think it's it's most of us don't have a lot of tools in our toolbox to deal with what life has to you know offer and this family these parents do not have the tools to deal with the trauma and the shame that they feel but also more importantly what their daughter went through I mean instead of sort of creating a safe space for her to talk about this trauma that happened to her and whether she's responsible for the tape or not really is immaterial it's about how do you deal with the trauma afterwards and this family you know not and I'm not blaming them, but, you know, they didn't have the tools to to create a space to talk about this. And I think most of us don't. And I think that, you know, growing up and I think that it, what's beautiful about the film and important about the film, I think, is to see how this family navigates this very difficult time. And they really end up or they end up being forced to navigate it because she speaks the truth. Mm-hmm. And says to her father at one point, you will always hate me for something I did when I was 13. And literally, that bomb goes off in a kitchen, and it changes everything. And it begins with the truth. But it's a hard thing to get to, and it's a hard thing to say. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And there's also that dynamic, too, of uh, Deanna's brother and Sosie's character, who are now living with uh, your parents, and they have a baby. And, mm-hmm. and the dad seems to kind of neglect both of his children because of mistakes they made. But that's what teenagers do, is we make mistakes. And it's always good to have your your parents there for support. Mm -hmm. Um, I do want to get to the audience. But first, I have to ask all of you, what was Kira like as a director? And do you think she should keep directing? Because I think you did a wonderful job. I thought she was awesome. Um, We worked very closely every day. And it never felt like an unsafe space. I never felt you know, pressured, it always felt easy or challenging in an exciting way. I'm having one of my great uh, I told you so moments uh, because I've always wanted her to direct. I've always pushed her to direct. I knew she was going to be a great director and I knew she was going to love it and both of those things are true. What about you, Travis? Uh, She was great to work with. Um, (laughs) (laughs) She was. She was... uh, Direct, communicated everything really well. Um, very specific. Um, and I felt like, I never really felt like I got into this situation. I, I feel like oftentimes as a producer and as a musician, sometimes you work with people that don't aren't necessarily in the music field and they don't know how to use certain kinds of terminologies. So they like ask you to do something. You're like, I don't know what. Like, like, can you please make this part bloom a little bit more? I'm like, that's not a thing. <laughs> I have no idea what you mean by that. So I didn't. But I didn't really get into that. I felt like I felt like she used correct, you know, correct language. And you know, the minute the minute I was told to correct something or change something or amend something in a certain way, I did it. And then you know, I constantly got the feedback back of like, oh, this is exactly what I meant. You get this. Thank you. So it was really positive experience for me. Oh, that's great. Are you, are you bitten by the directing oh my bug God, now? Completely. Yeah. I mean, I'm consumed, and and it was one of the most joyful and creative, f- fulfilling, creatively fulfilling experiences ever. And I just cannot wait to do it again. Yeah. Yeah. And I think this is a great Lifetime is a great channel for this to be on. It's thank a, you. And we got into some film festivals, so that was really nice too. Yeah, it's Not awesome. to brag, but yeah. I'm bragging. <laughs> brag away. Brag away. All right. Who has questions? I'm sure you guys do. Here we go. Hi, how are you? Hi. Hi. First of all, I have to say thank you for all the work that you all have been able to do over the course of the past few years. My question is, it's a two-part question. From the acting perspective, which scene, you don't have to give spoilers, <laughs> of which one was the most difficult to film? And then from the back end, which one was the most difficult to edit or even score? I, th- okay. I think the most difficult scene for me or I can't remember exactly but some with my dad were tough um John who played my dad John Tenney he um is a great guy but when he and we met prior to shooting he's awesome when he came to set he was really cold and closed off because that's how his character is and so it felt really weird I felt like judged and alienated which I realized in retrospect was good for the performance (laughs) but I felt kind of nervous to work with him um, in front of the camera because I was nervous around him. So that took me out of my head for a second um, 
in some of the beginning scenes with him. So that was the hardest for me. You know, I think for me, all those, all the kitchen scenes, you guys haven't seen the movie, which is such a drag, but, um, <laughs> but you will. Uh, and there are several uh, kitchen scenes, and I feel like the scenes in the kitchen are really the belly of the beast, and most family drama, <laughs> at least in my family, happens in the kitchen because everyone goes to the kitchen. And um, and we shot those scenes uh, pretty much in one day, and I needed to get them just, just, just right, and a lot of coverage in a very small space. Um, so I was worried about those scenes, but they turned out to be the greatest and exactly what I had in my head and beyond, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'd have to agree with the uh, kitchen scenes, especially when there was blowouts and arguments and everything, because I wanted to bring music in that captured like the emotion and the reaction of the scene, but at the same time, they were so emotional and there was so much like uh, the, the, there was so much need for sort of space of and silence of seeing how people would react to that that I really needed to give that and let the music kind of breathe around it as well. Kevin, I'm sure you're feeling very left out because you weren't in any of those kitchen no, scenes. No, I'm, I'm not feeling left out at all. No, And uh, they, none of the scenes were difficult. I love them all. <laughs> Who's next? Here we go. Hi. Hi, everyone. This question is for, for all of you. Uh, so certain reasons why I was mentioned, and that was a very bold and controversial show. And I was wondering, when you're dealing with tricky, very touchy subjects like this one, how do you know we're doing too much, people are going to be traumatized, we're doing too little, we're not, they're not going to be able to experience what the subjects are, really are? Like? Thank you for that question. That's a really great question. I, I have to say that for me, I know in one, in, in half a second when I'm watching a movie or a TV show when I'm being manipulated, and I hate it. And I felt like subtlety was the key here. And yes, really good point, subtle, but not so subtle that you don't feel anything. Um, it was very important to get everything right in order to support the nuance of that. And they are really hard subjects. And there's a lot of very sort of traumatic things that happen in this movie. And the trauma of seeing a family so unable to communicate is sort of gut-wrenching. And seeing Deanna's situation, especially in the beginning, that clearly she, she's being so slut-shamed and so bullied, you know, it, it kind of, it, it kind of, but the minute you you go over the top or you gild the lily or you put sappy music in, you're dead. I mean, to me, I, half of your intelligent, sophisticated, you know, well-schooled, you know, uh, act, uh, audience just goes away and they want to change the channel. So, so to me, that's the director's job. It really is. And, and I felt that responsibility and that weight. And I, and I think we achieved it quite, uh, quite a good balance of that. Hey guys. Um, so I was wondering, uh, since this was such an emotional uh, story, like, was it um, a little difficult for you to, you know, like for some of the scenes to keep it together, like in some of the scenes? Yeah, sometimes I, I cried behind the monitor. That happened a lot, but that was only a good thing. I mean, I think it was only a great thing. What about you? <laughs> um, I did a lot of tearing. I think I just have really moist eye ducts. But um, <laughs> yeah, some of the material is really deep. And you know, when you have to step into that character and feel those feelings, you're, you're going to get emotional. Uh, a Brian is unbelievable in the movie. I mean, her ability to tap into her emotions and to to uh, just give it give it all over. And her, I, I mean, it, she just she just gave it everything and it's beautiful and you feel every moment i mean i i'm not being very articulate but she's extraordinary thank you <laughs> well you can see her performance as well as kevin and hear travis's music and of course see kira's amazing direction this sunday on lifetime correct what time does it air eight o'clock eight o'clock your dvr yes <laughs> thank you all for being here thank you, thank you so, so much. much make sure thank to watch everybody. the film thank you thank you